In this video, I want to describe the active length tension curve, the passive length tension curve, and the combined length tension curve. The first thing you need to know is that these three curves describe what happens inside a muscle tendon unit. I use that word precisely because it's not just a muscle and the tendons are not just kind of stuck on the ends of the muscle, but the tendon runs all the way through the muscle and then the contractile part, the red muscle, is actually embedded in the tendon. The tendon becomes the epimyceum, perimyceum, and endomyceum around the various parts of the muscle as it goes through the muscle belly. So, what we're doing with our active, passive, and combined length tension curves are describing what happens inside that muscle tendon unit. So let's start with the passive length tension curve. I think it's probably one of the easier ones to understand. So here we have a graph. On the x-axis here, we are going to have length, okay, and then on the y-axis here, we're going to have tension. All right, and our passive length tension curve is going to look something like this. Initially, there's not much tension at all and there hasn't been much change in length. This bottom x-axis here could be considered to be change in length um, as well with increasing length going off to the right here. So initially there's not much tension, there hasn't been much change in length. With the passive, we label this up here, with a passive length tension curve. We start out like this, and there isn't much increase in tension with increase in length initially. However, at some point, we kind of take up all the extra length, and then the tension increases quite quickly, and so your passive length tension curve ends up looking something like that. Just want to illustrate that with an example. This is just an old towel. And so initially, our, with our passive length tension curve, we have some kind of you know, extra material here. And there's really no tension whatsoever in this towel. As I increase the length, you'll see the, the towel is actually getting longer. I'm increasing the length. So increase the length, but I'm still really not getting any tension in the towel. All right. However, once I've kind of taken up all of that extra slack, then I hit this point where I start to get tension in the towel. Now, once I get some tension in the towel, I can still, if I pull really hard, increase the length a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, but with that increase in length, you'll see that tension just skyrockets. Okay? This passive length tension curve then is uh, illustrating what happens in the non-contractile part of our muscle tendon unit. That is to say, the passive length tension curve indicates what happens in the connective tissue. The tendon on each end, and as the tendon goes through the muscle belly, the epiperiendomyceum as well. All right, it's all one thing. And so the passive length tension curve describes what happens with that. Okay? Then we have the active length tension curve. I'm going to draw that next to it here. Okay? Again, we'll have length there. and tension on the y-axis. 
Now this is going to be our active length tension curve. And this is going to represent what happens in the contractile part of the muscle tendon unit. That is to say, this is what happens in the muscle belly itself. The red muscle, as it contracts, that is described by the active length tension curve. One thing about this active length tension curve that might make it a little easier to understand is tension could also be understood to be force or force production. In the active length tension curve, the thing that produces the tension or the force on the y-axis is the contractile part of the muscle. And the contractile part of the muscle, the red muscle, is uh, composed of sarcomeres, which uh, consist of myosin and actin filaments. Uh, and the myosin filaments grab onto the actin filaments and pull on them to create the contraction. So let's see what that looks like just a little bit here because if you understand how the sarcomere works, then the active length tension curve makes sense. So I'm just kind of going to go in a mid-length here and draw my sarcomere here. All right, and then here you have the actin filaments. All right, so those things in purple are my actin filaments. And then in red here, I have my myosin. And my myosin has these little myosin heads on them that like to grab onto the actin and give it a pull. So when these myosin heads grab the actin and pull on it, this way, you get the muscle contracting. And in the mid-range here, you'll see that really all of these myosin heads are in a position where they can grab onto this actin filament, and there's still plenty of room to pull and contract further. When we're really, really short, on the left side of the length axis, things are a little different. When this gets really, really short, now, here's my actins again, okay. They might even overlap a little bit in this position. Okay. <coughs> and then my myosin, basically is kind of butting right up against these other bands, Z-bands, with their little myosin heads here, okay? And so at this point, if my myosin head were to try to grab on to my actin filament and pull this tighter, it can try all at once, but it can't because it's already kind of butted up here against the Z-band. It's got nowhere further to go. It simply cannot contract any further, no matter how hard it tries. On the other side of the length axis, or on the other end of the length axis, things are really elongated. Okay, so here's where your muscle might be really, really long. really stretched out passively, all right? And so you have the actin filaments here again, all right? And then in between, again, you're gonna have that myosin filament. The problem is, at this point, that myosin filament has little to no actin to actually grab onto. So, a good chunk of this myosin filament in here can't produce any tension or any force because there's no actin filament next to it to grab. So, what does that mean for our active length 
tension curve or length force curve? Well, down here where it's already contracted as far as it can go, no matter how hard it tries, it can't get any shorter. At this short length, we're not going to be able to produce really any additional force. We can kind of hold it that short, but we can't produce any additional force. And so here, our amount of tension or force we can produce at that point is going to be really low. Okay? Over here, where it's really, really elongated, because so much of our myosin filament cannot actually grab onto any actin, okay, there's just no actin for that to grab onto. Again, the myosin heads can't pull on anything, so you're not going to get a lot of force production or tension production way out here, okay? Right here in the middle, the sweet spot, kind of the baby bear area, just right. We have all of our myosin heads next to a actin filament so they can all grab and pull uh, like in a tug of war. And we have room for this thing to contract. So because we have all of the myosin heads pulling and we have room for this to get shorter, here we can develop quite a bit of tension or force in our um, contractile part of the muscle tendon unit. So the active length tension curve then is going to look something like that. If the muscle tendon unit has really gotten scrunched and it's too short, you're not going to get much force production. If the muscle tendon unit has gotten really elongated and stretched out, you're not going to get much force production. But if it's in the middle of the range of this muscle tendon unit, that's where you're going to get the most force production out of your active length tension curve. Next, we want to put the active length tension curve and the passive length tension curve together into one. So at this point, we can make our combined length tension curve. You'll see I've erase the board and just put our passive length tension curve and our active length tension curve up there for reference. And from these two, we're going to put them together to make the combined length tension curve. It's just the combination of the passive and the active. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw our passive length tension curve here first. And I'm just going to kind of draw it lightly. And remember it goes something like that. Then I'm going to draw our active length tension curve. And again, just kind of draw it lightly. And you'll remember that one goes something like that. Okay. So how do we combine those two? Well, the way you combine those two is you just add them together. You, you sum them. So uh, right here at this really short length, we're not getting much from the active length tension curve. So Basically, it's the, the passive plus the active is, is pretty much right down here yet, okay? Now, once we get these two together, you'll take, you know, the passive plus the active to get the combined. So you take this distance plus this distance, and you get your combined. So it's going to start to look something like this, and it's going to get further and further away from that active length tension curve because as we get more length, our passive length tension curve tends to add a little bit more tension as well. And it's going to go up like that. Now here we end up with a little bit of a dip where the active length tension curve is dropping off and the combined length tension curve hasn't kind of reached its max yet. And so you end up with a little dip there and whoops. And then you're going to, this is going to go up like that. Okay, so your combined length tension curve in purple here is just the sum of the passive and active length tension curves, and it's just going to be kind of this big ol' S shape, more or less like that. And that just is when you put your tendon and your muscle, the non-contractile, and the contractile parts of your muscle tendon unit together, 
the combined length tension curve is what it can actually develop. Okay? Now, one thing important to notice about this combined length tension curve is it does, you know, it just kind of goes off the end, you know, deep end here, and you get a lot of tension up here, but the tension that you get up here is almost all passive tension, very little active tension. So there's tension there, but it can't actually contract. All right? It's more in the middle here that you're going to get some good contraction uh, or shortening of the muscle with a fair amount of force from your active component or contractile component of the muscle tendon unit. 